So our second speaker, who will be mic'd up in a moment, is um, Dr. Mike Zelensky from uh, NASA, from the Johnson Space Centre in Houston. And uh, Mike has worked with uh, NASA, I think, for more than 30 years and uh, has uh, extensively studied um, many meteorites and particularly Murchison. And uh, Mike's going to share with uh, his knowledge about the composition of the Murchison meteorite and in particular uh, um, information about the organic material. So all the way from Houston, Mike Zelensky. All the way from the audio. <laughs> So I thank the organizers for inviting me here to give a chance to uh, meet very, very friendly people here at Murchison. This is probably the nicest place I've ever visited. I've been to a lot of places, so I really thank you for your hospitality. Uh, so I want to talk about some uh, aspects of the mineralogy of the Murchison meteorite, especially related to water and organics. A lot of this was, was uh, introduced tomorrow by Gretchen, who's out there. She can heckle if she wants. Um, and uh, I've worked for 35 years on meteorites. So the first meteorite I analyzed was Murchison back in 1983. That's a long time ago. Um, and again, I specialize in the record left by water and recently organics in that meteorite. And so uh, I'll go kind of rapidly here. I have a very short talk to give. But these are different kinds of carbonaceous chondrites. And Murchison is a CM chondrite. And the basic mineralogy of these chondrites and I won't say much about this, except that there's quite a varied mineralogy there. There's the, miner the primary minerals that Phil talked about that formed in the nebula or before. Then there are minerals that formed later due to the activity of, of parent body heating, metamorphism, shock, and liquid water. And the organics were changed through all these processes. So I'll just throw a few slides to briefly show you some of the things you can see in these meteorites. Um, these are all microscope views. This one's these are transmitted light views on a microscope like the one across the street. These show clay minerals uh, in the meteorite formed by water. Another clay mineral called saponite. Uh, this is about a millimeter across, this view. There are garnets in some sea chondrites. This is a, a garnets in a meteorite called kaidun. This is a 10 micron scale bar. This is an electron microscope view showing uh, this matrix here which is just full of clay minerals, mostly serpentine. That's what you see in Murchison. And there are carbonates, just like you see in the ocean or in lakes or ponds. And they form from liquid water. Uh, here's carbonates in uh, Boroskino, a meteorite very similar to Murchison, calcium carbonate. Um, uh, here's a vein of carbonate running through a thin section of meteorite. There was liquid water traveling through cracks in the rock, depositing minerals. Uh, here's calcite in a really cool meteorite called Maribo, which is a, you know, you had, what, hundreds of kilograms of Murchison fall in this town. Uh, what, 100 kilograms is left in meteorites now in museums. One gram of this meteorite was all that was recovered. One gram. So you're very lucky, you know. Uh, and then here's calcite in a meteorite called Kaidun. Uh, same kind of calcite you see in, uh, in hot spring deposits. And as you might expect, these minerals often form from the activity of liquid water, and there's actually droplets of liquid water in these meteorites. It isn't just water in clay minerals. It's actually liquid water droplets. They're, they're called aqueous fluid inclusions. You see these in all kinds of rocks on the Earth. And here are little droplets of water. This is in, these are all in, these are in Murchison. Here's a droplet of water here. Here's one here. Here's a droplet here. These are all tiny. There are a few microns across. There's a bubble there that floats around in there. Here's a whole series of fluid inclusions in a calcite grain. Um, here's, a, here's one here. It's very hard to see. A crummy picture here. They're very tiny and hard to spot, but they're there. And they're, they're nanomoles of water, really tiny amounts. And we're just barely able to, to analyze these today. There are sulfides. Um, here's a pyrotite, pentlandite. A really cool sulfide uh, texture here. Um, there are these weird mineral called tachelonite, which uh, I, I just love this mineral. It's really cool. It's a layered sulfide phase, which occurs on the Earth very, very rarely, maybe like five localities, but it's very, very common in Murchison, and no one knows why. Um, and there are really cool, weird minerals. Uh, this is a little clast in uh, the Maribel meteorite, which is similar to Murchison, 
with apatite, calcium phosphate, and magnetite. It's kind of a cool little Peter Max looking thing. I think I like that. There's uh, gypsum, sulfates. There's weird metals actually formed during aqueous alteration. There's a vein of a metal that formed during aqueous alteration. Then there's actually halite, like you put on your, on your chips, right? Sodium chloride, salt, that you find in some meteorites. And you have organics. And uh, Gretchen talked about this, and so did Phil. They're quite rare in most meteorites, but in Murchison, you're talking about several weight percent of organics, which is a lot of carbon. And people have found uh, dozens of different organic compounds in Murchison, but they're very low concentration individually, but there's a lot of them. And overall, the, comp the, the concentration's on the order of a couple of weight percent of carbon by organic, which is an awful lot. But there, the fact you have so many different kinds of compounds reflects the different processes that have affected this meteorite over the last four and a half billion years. Now, a big mystery is that for things like amino acids, you can have left-handed and right-handed forms. Most of you probably know that. And living things on Earth only take left-handed forms. The mystery, why is that? Since they both form with equal probability. And for many, many years, people measured amino acids in meteorites, like Murchison, especially Murchison, and they always saw equal amounts of left-handed and right-handed forms, which fit the idea that these had to have formed non-biologically, right? But recently, techniques have gotten better and better, and you have a lot of meteorite to analyze, if people realize that, in fact, you also have an excess of left-handed forms in Murchison. So back to the mystery why this excess of left-handed forms in meteorites, too. Does it mean they form biologically? You know, probably not. But why would you have this excess in the first place since they should form equal probability? It's still a big mystery. Uh, so here's a thin section of uh, CM chondrite. And uh, this is uh, about three millimeters across, just showing what you're looking at. This is an electron microscope view. Here's calcium carbonates here. The bright white things are iron sulfides and iron oxides. But you see here and there really dark materials. Here's one here, here's one here, here's one here, 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 all through here. These are clots, grains of solid organic material. Um, here's one here. This is a round hydrocarbon globule. These are really common in carbonaceous chondrites. Uh, there's a two micron scale. This is just about five micrometers across. If you, took, if you took a human hair and sliced it, it has about this diameter. So these are really tiny hydrocarbon globules. Here's some more. These are, these are transmission electron microscope views of some globules, and they're hollow, and they're layered. These are uh, lipids. And the molecules these, can, these are formed from actually permit certain organic materials to move through the walls in, others to move out. And these would be beautiful protocells. This is probably the first step towards a living thing. These aren't bacteria. These aren't living things. They aren't formed biologically. They form just naturally from organics uh, interacting with water. Uh, you can make them in the lab um, as high school projects. But these are all over the place in Murchison. So Murchison's been, meteorites like Murchison have been falling to the earth for its entire history. Imagine the early earth, the oceans are forming, and floating on those oceans are, are layers of these little organic nanoglobules, just like a, like a slick on the surface, an oil slick, just waiting for life to start. So these were being present uh, at the earliest time on the earth and the other terrestrial planets. Another thing is, what was inside of these? We find these, we always find them by slicing them open, making thin sections and looking at them in the microscope. No one has any clue what was inside. You know, was it little, little bacteria? Probably not. You know, uh, little, little fossil animals invading the earth, viruses? Probably not. Water? Probably. We just don't know. No one's found that out yet. So one thing I've been doing is uh, looking at um, the chemistry of the organics, especially the isotopes of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen in these organics, and don't, don't, these aren't scary maps, don't worry about this. This shows uh, the relative amounts of different kinds of carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen. And the point here is uh, the heavier isotopes are bright yellow in these slides. So here's a, 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 a piece of organic material from that meteorite, like Murchison. And areas shown by the arrows are enriched in very heavy isotopes of hydrogen, nitrogen, and carbon. 
And those sorts of enrichments require very, very cold formation environments. They, they wouldn't happen on Earth or, or on any terrestrial planet, but it could happen at the very edge of the slower nebula or in interstellar space. So one idea is that these organics are, in fact, uh, pre-solar interstellar organics, uh, which have survived billions of years in these meteorites. Uh, and interacting with liquid water to form little globules, this is a really cool result. We're just publishing this right now, as a matter of fact. So because these meteorites are available, because these have gotten better and better through the years, we're finally able to make really cool analyses of these meteorites and finally learn about the origin of the precursors to living things. So here's another plot. Don't get scared about this. This is a, a, a plot that shows a, a plot of the kind of oxygen in different kinds of meteorites versus uh, the kind of chrome. And these plots are made for all kinds of elements. And uh, a person in California was just plotting up stuff randomly, pretty much. And he found that a strange thing, when you make this plot with oxygen versus chrome, for chrome 54, oxygen 17, most kinds of meteorites plot in this field right here. All the carbonaceous chondrites, like murchison, the water, carbon-bearing meteorites, plot over here. And you normally expect a continuum uh, plot like this, as, because concentrations change kind of gradually from meteorite to meteorite type. Why would this be this big gap here between these two groups? And one idea is that, just an idea, right, it's probably wrong, that these guys here formed in the inner solar system, inward of the giant planets, where we are right now, right? And that these guys, there was a gap which was caused by the giant planets being in the way, and then these meteorites, including Murchison, formed in the outer solar system, perhaps even out beyond the giant planets. Nobody knows. And then this is just an idea. And, and so these meteorites are available, like Murchison, to test these new ideas. That's happening right now. Uh, no one knows what's really going on here. Uh, and the meteorites with the halite plot up here. They're extremely weird, perhaps very, very formed, perhaps, again, way out in the outer solar nebula. And uh, I'll finish up talking about some strange meteorites that have table salt in them. And one of those is Murchison. So maybe 20, about 30 years ago, a scientist in the UK was looking at Murchison and reported finding salt in the meteorite, table salt. And nobody believed him. And he went to, he's still alive. He didn't go to his grave, but he's, you know, he's hanging there. He still believes this day he was right. And he, he probably was right because... 20 years ago, two more meteorites fell with salt inside. And normally this would be destroyed by rain or cutting it with water or washing it or anything. You could destroy the salt. But it's still there. It's real. It's purple color because of radiation damage. Uh, a really cool thing is, first you can, one cool thing is you can actually date salt. And the dates, are, by three different techniques, all turn out to be as old as the solar system, four and a half billion years which is a big surprise. And there's also fluid inclusions in the salt. This is a little bunny, a little eyeball here, right? So this is liquid, aqueous fluid. This is a, this is a uh, vapor bubble. And so you can see those here. Look down here. You uh, come to my lab. I can show you these in a, in a microscope. You can easily see the bubbles moving around in the fluids. These are droplets of primordial water. The oldest we have, four and a half billion years old or older, could be older, we don't know, uh, sitting in table salt. Um, and this, this just the, the heat from the light in the microscope causes little currents there to cause the bubbles to move around. These fell 20 years ago. For the longest time, all we could do is just look at them because they're so tiny, just a few microns across, you couldn't do much with them. But in the last few years, that's changed. And one of the things we can do now is actually analyze the fluid composition of the water. These are nanomoles of water, a few microns across. They're really tiny. But just this last December, we went to a lab and froze the samples and then used an ion beam to, to basically drill down into the sample and expose uh, these little, uh, like, snow sickles of, of primordial water and analyze the composition of the fluid for the first time ever. And we expected to see things like calcium or iron, magnesium, elements are easily dissolvable out of rock. We should expect to see those there. We were kind of surprised. Well, this is 
Andy Del Delicon, who's a crazy Romanian guy who runs a lab, my friend Bob Bodner. Um, uh, we found, uh, this is the biggest inclusion we analyzed. It's about 20 microns across. It looks like a doggy bone. Here's the little vapor bubble. And so these plots show maps of different, different compounds in the salt as you're milling down through. Here's the inclusion here. We see NaOH in the solution, NO, CNO. The cool thing is we expected to see water, OH, maybe some magnesium, maybe some, so maybe some sodium. What we saw was lots and lots of organic compounds all over the place. And here's some more. Uh, just amazing. We did see water and potassium, what we expected to see. But what we did see is these fluids are really, really enriched in organic compounds. And we're not really sure exactly what. We're still calibrating these analyses. They're not published yet. But the result is we, we now, though, big surprise that uh, these fluids that we're seeing observed meteorites contain not just water, but a, a, huge, a huge abundance of very complex organic compounds. And this technique actually tears the molecules apart as you analyze them. These are probably much more complicated organic molecules. They've been ripped apart during analysis. Maybe in 10 years more, we can actually analyze those molecules in situ. That's still coming. But the point is that, uh, you know, think about it. These solutions were formed four and a half billion years ago somewhere in the solar system, somewhere in the outer solar system. It was liquid water, room temperature water, loaded with organics. So there were environments in the earliest solar system with abundant liquid, abundant liquid water at room temperature, this temperature here, right? Rich in organic precursors to life. You know, where were those places, right? Did life start there? We, we don't know. And it's, it's, I, it's likely these samples, identical to these, are in the Murchison meteorite, because people found halite there. They just didn't believe it. Go back and now and look again. I'm sure we're going to find them. But these materials were definitely being carried to the early Earth, probably the precursors to life on Earth. But they're also being carried to Mars, Venus, and the moons of the giant planets, where we see water volcanism today. Here's Enceladus, the sixth largest moon of Saturn, with modern salty volcanism today. And so in the subsurface of these giant moons, there are potentially life-forming environments right now. And so uh, it could be like our, you know, our relatives here. But certainly Murchison is your distant relative. It's like your great, 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 great grandparents. I mean, the water in your body and the organics in your bodies all came from probably from meteorites just like Murchison. And so just think about that. Thank you so much. Just stay there, Mike. <laughs> um, questions, anyone? I might actually come around and, and give you the microphone. Yes, thank you. I was interested in the purines and pyrimidines because they're, of course, the building blocks of DNA and RNA. And which ones were, were found? Both, uh, all the ones in, in living organisms were found in Murchison and more besides. So uh, all the amino acids that you see in living things are present in, in meteorites. But also a lot of other amino acids that aren't, aren't used by living biological systems are also there as well. They're all there. No one's seen DNA or RNA. Think about it. These rocks have been exposed to radiation for billions of, for millions of years at least, if not longer. So it's really amazing that any amino acids survive intact anyway. If there have been things like DNA or RNA, it probably been long ago have been destroyed. So the fact we have such complex organics surviving makes you think, gee, what else might have been there before that's just been destroyed by radiation? And these halides have been, they were purple and blue colored because of radiation uh, causing changes to the structure. It certainly affected the organics as well. John? <clears throat> Mike, what do you think about the rumors that they're starting to catch some pretty weird fish in the uh, Moringa Basin? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we worry about that. <laughs> You know, when the, we first saw halite, I mean, it was hard to believe it was really there. We had some like, contaminated the meteorite. So it was very reassuring when we, when we would do date them and find they actually were too old to have provided itself. Um. Question up here. Um, given the, the relatively small amount of carbon in the, the gross mass of the meteorite, do we have an indication of what caused its smell when, oh. it, when it came into Earth? And was that intrinsic to the meteorite? Or was it a combination of um, perhaps atmospheric gas dissociation due to thermal shock combined with the, the meteorite components? 
I think, I think it was all of those things. Um, and then partly it was due to sulfur-bearing compounds, too. So we had another meteorite. I'm not, I have no experience of smelling Murchison and smelling compounds, but there was a similar meteorite that fell in Canada 20 years ago called Tagish Lake. And, I, and those actually fell during winter on a frozen lake, were recovered still frozen. And some came to my lab still frozen. We thawed them out, and there was this really strong smell. And we always suspected that they were sulfur-bearing compounds involved in that. So I suspect that the atmospheric entry modified that to some degree. But you know, the heating from the atmospheric entry only goes in a few millimeters at best. So most of the meteorites still very cold, even through atmospheric passage. And so I think any, any uh, uh, smell from the atmospheric entry would have been long gone. And when you break open a fresh piece and make that smell, that's, that's intrinsic to the meteorite. And by the way, you know, dogs can smell that. And there are, there are falls where dogs go out and bring in pieces from the field. So I suspect that if you had, to, had let dogs go to find this meteorite, you would have recovered more of the Murchison at the time. So keep that in mind when it happens again. You know, let your dogs loose, let them run out and, and find some meteorites. There are people in this room who can testify that the meteorite is still degassing today. And that those same smells are still there today. Uh, but that's another story. Uh, I'd like to thank Mike for coming all the way uh, uh, with some support from ANU, which was, a, which was fantastic, the combination of NASA and, and Australian National University brought Mike to Australia, and uh, he's sharing his knowledge with us, and uh, it's great to have him here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, buddy.